-hmm. And you can do things like this really simply. So, if I type in here words, is that big enough to read for everyone? I can make it bigger. Now can you read words? Like that word, words? Okay. If your answer to the first question was no, then okay. different question. Okay, so let's take, for example, just some function from section 2.1 and let's work through how to compute this. We did the 2.1, we did the velocity problem, that was one that we did, uh, but that's like a really nice, really nice function. The next example in the book is this one, which is not so nice. Um, square root of t squared minus 9, sorry, plus 9, minus 3 over t squared. So this is like the very first example where they want you to find the limit as t approaches 0 of this function. Okay? So given some function, given some value that we want the uh, variable to approach, um, how do we compute this, right? That's the goal for today, just we're going to do some of these. Uh, that's the first goal. We'll just do several and we sort of get the idea of. From last time, do you remember what a pitfall might be? It was sort of right at the end. When you're asked to find a limit, you always need to ask yourself, does it even exist? When won't it exist? Well, it might not exist if what two things don't agree? The left, hand and the right hand. The left hand and the right hand limits don't exist. Okay, so what's the left hand limit and what's the right hand limit? We need to compute, I'm just going to call this f of t from now on. This, and we need to compute this, and we need to verify that they do in fact equal each other. In which case we say it exists and the value is what they agree at. So in practice, what does that mean? So we're going to take the value zero, and that's going to kind of be like our home base. So I'll put that here. And then I'm going to put numbers that get increasingly closer to zero from the left, which means the negative side. <clears throat> so 2.9 is not really close to zero but it's to the left. Something closer would be 99, negative 0.99. Something even closer would be negative 0.999. And we just keep doing this, right? So you can imagine a younger professor love just like with his nerdy fingers and a really small calculator trying to like compute these and write them on pieces of paper when I was a lot smaller and younger. Right, now what, what do you do? You take things that are kind of close to zero but from the right side. So we've got 0 0.1, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001, and maybe we can go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like this. So these here, this is going to represent the right hand limit, and these up here will, will basically show you the left hand limit limit. Okay? And the idea is we should be able to put in a guess here if the limit exists. We should be able to put in a guess for what it is and if these two things agree. So what do you do on the right? You say, okay, in Excel or in Google Sheets, you can type the character equals and it will then assume whatever you're going to write after this is some sort of formula. Okay, and there's all sorts of things you can do. You can literally type, like, for example, in this problem, square root, S-Q-R-T, and it will take the square root of something. So what are we going to take the square root of? T squared plus 9 is what we want to take the square root of. So we click on what our variable's value should be. We use the squaring operator there. Then we add 9 to it. And this is now going to be the square root of point, negative point nine squared plus nine. You following? 
so far. If you haven't seen this before, maybe you're not, but if you have, then this is not brand new. So then we continue our formula, minus 3, and we close that group because we want to make sure we're dividing all of this by t squared. Um, yeah, I uh, was doing things backwards in just a second. We'll, uh, we'll sort this out. Some of you might have recognized my error by now. Maybe not. And we're going to divide by the same number, but we're going to square that. Okay, so why did I, what did I do wrong? Yes? Um, it's squared by Oh, um, I think my oh. function's right. Square root of t squared plus 9, subtract 3 from the square root, and divide the whole thing by t squared. I think that's correct. My problem's actually right here. Do these numbers get closer to zero? No. Yeah, so what, what? Point zero 0.09 maybe would have been like better? Or maybe like point zero 0.01? Does it really matter if I use point 0.9 or point 0.1? And then, so long as it gets closer to zero, you're okay. But I can, we can do this. If you have in your notes point 0.9, we're going to do it like this. We'll, we'll keep it, and you'll see. It won't matter. Sorry about that. Okay. And I'm double checking. This does, in fact, get closer to zero. So we're good. So these numbers get increasingly closer to zero from the left. These numbers get increasingly closer to zero from the right. And we've written our function here, and it's about 0.16 when we're kind of far away. Now here's where the glorious thing occurred. If you don't know about this, Excel and Sheets and Numbers, whatever they are, they have automatic fill features where you just click this bottom right-hand corner and you drag, and it will automatically take your formula and adjust it. That's the power of inference right there. Now it's taking the square root of this number squared plus 9 minus 3, then divided by this number squared. And now in this one it's taking this number squared plus 9, square rooting it, subtracting 3, then dividing by that number squared. This is awesome, right? Man, I wouldn't have arthritis today had I had this back in the day, right? Okay. So. We need to do the same thing down here. What we're going to do is we're going to just delete that zero, fill down. <laughs> if I put zero there, Excel tells me you can't do that. Does that make sense? We're dividing by t squared. So zero, we can't do that. This is, zero is not in the domain of this function. Okay, now my question, yes. What was the equation again? Right here. Okay. No, um, to the Excel. Got you. Right here. So yeah, in Excel speak, I can write that here. S Q R T, and then this is like your cell, whichever one it is. Square. So caret two means to the second power. Plus nine. Minus three. This all needs to be in a grouping bracket because you want to take all of that and divide it by, so there's a slash there, the cell, whatever it is, here it to. Okay? All right. So what is the limit of our function from the left? It's approximately 0.16 repeating, I would guess. From the right. I would guess it's also 0.16 repeating, right? It looks to be so. If you wanted to be more confident, what would you do? You could graph it. There's a great way to do it. And then use the y-axis to measure it. There it is. 
we're approaching zero, right? So if you have a nice graphing calculator, you zoom in and you say, oh no, it's zero. If you, maybe it'll let me do this, maybe it won't. I can't zoom in far enough. You could say, hey, uh, 0.16 repeating, that's exactly five thirds. Five thirds? I think it's half of a third, which is a sixth. So a graph works really well. You have to estimate that by zooming in further and further. From this table, how could you be more sure that it's exactly 0.1666, just repeating? How can you be more sure? Do you know? You're looking at me? No, you don't know? Okay, okay. <clears throat> well, we'll have an agreement. Like, if you're looking at me, maybe that means you have something to say. If you don't, just go with this. Okay, good. <laughs> Maybe that's why math people look at their shoes all the time. We don't have anything to say. Yeah. Add more zeros. This is the like the quintessential idea of the limit. The closer you get to this, the closer this gets to the limit. Okay. So I mean, to do that, you just add more zeros. Okay, now it says it's zero, probably because I oops, broke it. That's too many zeros. It doesn't know how to handle that. It probably rounds that to zero and then says that's, you know, undefined. So add more zeros. <laughs> I think we're having problems with like, uh, do you remember what happened last time? And there was some erratic behavior with these sheets. Do you remember that last time? Okay, so with. Google Sheets don't get too close. It behaves erratically. With Excel, maybe not. Like for example, this is closer to one sixth than this is, which is really odd. Still odd. That's strange. Okay, is this clear how we found it though? Yes. Okay, let's do another function. The next example was. Oh. Okay, we're gonna do this one. You remember sine, right? Okay. Our goal is to guess the value of this sine of the number divided by the number. Okay, do you have an intuition? What happens to sine as x gets closer to zero? What is the sine value? when the angle gets close to zero? It's zero, very good. You think about the unit circle. Let's take a positive angle and approach it from this direction, so that's the, you know, the right hand limit. The sine value is the y coordinate, so the closer we get to an angle of zero, the more this gets closer to one and zero, so the sine becomes zero. So this is gonna become zero. Unfortunately, so is this. This is a great example of what happens when you have division by zero of zero. Okay. Let's see how well Google Sheets does this one. Uh, we can keep the same numbers, right? We're getting closer to zero, so we can keep the same column of t, but now we just need to redefine our function. So we type equals, and then sine is built into Google Sheets. That's great. We select what we're going to take the sine of, we divide it by that, hit enter. And then autofill. Yes, in fact, we want that autofill. Okay, so the left hand limit appears to be about one. The right hand limit gets to one. So does the limit exist? Yes. What does it appear to be? One. 
you could graph it if you wanted. <clears throat> if you zoom out appropriately, you can find the curve. There it is. And the, the graph tells you right away it's one. Right? Okay? Is this pretty clear? I, I feel like this is really straightforward, right? Okay. Questions on computing limits? Just sort of in general. No? Okay, so now let's do one that might give you a question. That's what we're going to find the limit of as x gets closer to zero. So in your brain, think about this real quick. Division by a number close to zero. Think about what happens. The closer you get to zero, yes. larger and larger. the larger the value becomes. Okay, this is a different kind of limit than what we've had before. Up until now, the limits have been a number. Like you could tell me what it was, one or one sixth. But with limits like this, we're not dealing with like a number. In fact, we're going to use an idea, which means it grows without bounds. We're going to use an idea to define this limit. So let's find the left hand limit, one divided by this number. And the right hand limit. 1 divided by this number. First of all, do they equal each other? Does it seem like they're going to? No. So right away we say this limit does not exist. Okay? Each individual limit does exist. The left-hand limit, let's narrow in on that. The closer we get to 0, the smaller and smaller and smaller it becomes. Right? Could you make this number as small as you wanted? How would you make it smaller? You would just keep adding numbers. Add zeros. Okay? That's going to be like the Sunday school answer today. Just add more zeros. Okay? Good. When you have a situation like this where you can make something as small as you want just by getting a little closer, we say that that limit. Well, this one is negative infinity. This is not a number. You'll never get there. It's an idea, and it's just communicating that if you get closer to this number from the left, you can get this as negative as you want. If I wanted this limit, if I wanted this value to be smaller than a negative of one billion, you would just get appropriately close to zero. If you wanted it to be closer or smaller than negative a billion billions, you would just get appropriately closer. You just add more zeros. So there's no depth to this limit. It gets as small as you want it to be. So we say that. Similarly, the right hand limit there, it, it's as big as we want it to be, that number. We can make it bigger by getting closer to zero. If this is the case, we just say the limit is positive infinity. Again, that's not a number. We will never have this. But it's just the idea to communicate that we can make it as big as we want by just getting a little closer to this. This is a infinite limits is what they call them in your book. Okay. Now let's look at one different one. Similar, but a slight modification. We're going to square this. I'll give you 10 seconds to just think about what's going to happen in this situation. And then we'll just plug in the numbers and see. So now that you've thought about it for like 10 seconds, my question out loud is, does this limit exist?
Maybe counterintuitively, the answer is yes, it does. Because the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit agree. They agree on one thing. They agree that no matter how close you get to zero, if you get closer and closer to zero, the end result is a bigger and bigger positive number. If we approach from the left, these numbers just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. If we approach from the right, these numbers just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So both these limits are plus infinity. If we want to make the value bigger, we just get closer. Which means they're the same, which means this limit does exist, which means the limit of this is positive infinity. It's the only requirement that you need for a limit to exist. It's okay if it's infinite, that's fine. The only requirement you need is both the left hand and the right hand limits are the same. They agree. Is that clear? Okay, if it's not clear now, ask away. I've got one more example that might blow your minds, might not, I don't know. Probably not, that's what I would guess. It's only like two people asleep right now, so that, that's good. Everyone looks around again. Okay, no questions. All right. Oh, boy. <clears throat> So sine as a function, what's it look like? A what? A wave. A wave, very good. And it, it like oscillates back and forth at a fixed <laughs> rate, right? What if we could find a way to make that rate increase? Do you think that's possible? Yeah. Can we make it so that like at a certain point in time, the frequency at which it oscillates just goes crazy? The answer is yes. What's the limit at that point where the frequency goes crazy? That's my question. Here you go. It's kind of a, a dirty graph here. This is sine of 1 over x. Doesn't look anything like the original sine function, except for the fact that it just oscillates back and forth, right? Let me adjust, perhaps, the x-axis. I don't want it to go from negative 1.5. I want negative 1, negative 1, negative 0.25 will go from. And then we'll spread that out to 0.25. So we're zooming in on the x-axis. Notice how things just go crazy the closer and closer we get to zero, right? Okay, so tell me. What's the left-hand limit of this? And tell me what the right-hand limit is. You can zoom in if you want, but it's not going to change the picture. This is a different class of functions now, where the limit doesn't exist for an entirely different reason. Before, it didn't exist because the left hand didn't agree with the right hand. But in this case, you can't even tell me, I can't even tell you what the limit is on the left or what the limit is on the right. It's made apparent when you look at a table of values. So we'll do that next. But the basic idea is this. <clears throat> if I take... Um, can I do this? Why? Maybe I can do this. Um, negative 0.125 less than x less than 0.125. Yep. Okay. So if I take a very narrow band around around zero, it's hard to see there, but there you go. If I look close to zero, that's the thing we're getting close to in our limit. 
what values for sure does this function take? Well, it definitely takes a value 1, and it definitely takes a value negative 1 on the left-hand side of 0. Right? So the basic idea is no matter how narrow I make that strip, because it oscillates infinitely, infinitely at 0, there's always 1s and negative 1s in that little narrow strip. So in the table of values, that would equate to these numbers never sort of leveling out at something. They're erratically changing from 1 to negative 1, no matter how close we get to 0. They just erratically change. So there's no pattern in the approach. Okay, so maybe we'll try that. It might be difficult to see here because I, I, didn't, I don't have too many numbers that I'm plugging in, and these are not great values to be plugging in, but take a look. Numbers are close to 1, and then they pop down to negatives. It doesn't look like there's any pattern in that approach. If we go over here, it's, it's even worse, which is good. It's a good thing. As we start to approach 0, we have a negative number, and then a positive number, and then a negative number, and then a, a small positive number. And then a, a negative number, 0.3 again, I don't know what either is. Okay, and if I get closer to zero, it doesn't change because we look at this graph and we just zoom in and we say, nothing changes. It's just dense in there. It's always oscillating up and down. So this limit does not exist for an entirely different reason. It's not because this limit does not agree with this limit, it's because neither of these does not, neither, neither of these do this. Questions about that one? Yes, please, thank you. Is it the same with sine and tan? Like, will it continue to oscillate like that? Oh, OK. Uh, I think I understand your question, but I'll, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. You mean like taking cosine of 1 over x? Mm -hmm. Yes, cosine of 1 over x does the same thing, because it's the same as sine, but shifted left oh. or right a certain amount. Oh. And that doesn't change what it looks like. Um, tangent, on the other hand, <coughs> looks crazier. Remember that tangent is not a wave. Tangent is like the previous ones, but to the thousand degree. <coughs> sine and cosine are limited between negative one and one. Mm -hmm. Tangent wasn't. It had these, it had these kind of x cubed like branches mm -hmm. that repeated over and over again. So now those things are going to repeat more and more frequently, which means before. We have this nice boundary above and below. Tangent doesn't have that boundary. So it's worse. I can zoom out. And there's no end to how tall these things are. So the left-hand limit oscillates back and forth between positive infinity and negative infinity. This one oscillates between negative infinity and positive infinity. So neither of them exist because it's like both ends of the spectrum in one. Very good. Great question. One piece of terminology, something I, I think maybe you've heard before, maybe not though. If any of the following are true, so this is related to what we're, we're just talking about with infinite limits. If any of the following are true, so the limit 
as x approaches some value a, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to keep repeating it over and over again, of some function x, If you approach A from the left and you get pause to infinity, or you approach it from the right and you get pause to infinity, or if you approach it from the left and you get negative infinity, or you approach it from the right and you get negative infinity, or if the limit just in general is either positive or negative infinity, okay, that's what I was forgetting either of them, then we have a specific name for the line x equals a. This is a vertical line at that value a. It's called a vertical asymptote. of those graphs that we looked at before. Um, for example, 1 over x, we took that limit just a bit ago. We discovered its limits. It turns out from the left it's negative infinity. So from the left, negative infinity. That middle top one is true. So right away we know this line x equals 0, which is vertical, the blue one there. That's a vertical asymptote for this graph. Alternatively, if we had looked at the right-hand limit for 1 over x, we see it's plus infinity. This one's true, which means x equals 0 is a vertical asymptote. Same thing, right? We also looked at 1 over x squared. If we look at the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit, they're the same. They're both plus infinity. So two of these things are true, again, which means x equals 0 is an asymptote. Okay? So if you've never heard that before, that's, there's your little bit of mathematical lingo for the day. Um, this is, uh, you know, there's some questions related to this sort of thing. Um, using graphs, it's, it's quite easy to solve things like this. For example, finding the vertical asymptotes of tangent of x. Looking at this graph, it's kind of apparent what they are. But if you remember definitions of functions, for example, tangent is sine of x divided by cosine of x. <clears throat> That's kind of the same graph of tangent, right? Usually, vertical asymptotes, usually, occur at division by 0 locations, and usually, usually. So what are the vertical asymptotes of tangent? Well, that's where cosine is zero. If you took the limit from the left or the limit from the right at a location where cosine is equal to zero, you would find one of these six is true, which means we have a vertical asymptote at that location. For example, look at cosine of pi over two, right? So tangent of pi over two, that doesn't really exist. If you look at the limit of tangent as x goes to pi over 2 from the left or goes to pi over 2 from the right, you'll find that these things are true up here, which means there's a vertical asymptote at x equals pi over 2. From the graph, that's apparent. <clears throat> from a table of values, less so, perhaps. <clears throat> So you can use limits to help find vertical asymptotes. That, that's the point. Questions on that? No. Okay. So 
that concludes section 2.2. Standing break or anything yet? We okay? Okay. Can I erase this vertical asymptote? was basically, you know, those two problems, tangent problem and uh, velocity problem, uh, sort of gave you the intuition, the idea behind finding limits and finding, you know, this uh, diminishing process leading to a, a, an end result, right? And that was directly shown in sort of an intuitive and computational way in 2.2, what we just did with all those calculations, getting closer and closer to something, uh, and then uh, a, a function getting closer and closer to some value, or not. So now in 2.3, we're gonna we're gonna just suppose that we we know limits. Okay, we're not gonna start we're not gonna compute things this time around. We're just going to uh, look at some general properties of them. Okay, so we're gonna suppose a lot of limits just exist, and and so what can we do with things that we know exist? Um, I'm just gonna go from there. So there's several laws. Suppose the limit at x goes to a of a function f of x. I'm going to give this one a capital L. This is different from what your book does. Uh, I'm going to just go with it though. And the limit as x goes to a, so we need these two things to agree first of all, g of x is m. Say follows right after. I hope that's okay. So previous sections dealt with how to compute these and what they were. Okay, so now we're just going to say, hey, we've got this number L, we've got this number M, which you can arrive at from these processes with these functions. Okay. Then maybe you can come up with a guess for about this one. What is the limit? as x goes to a of the sum f of x plus g of x. What would your guess be? What would you hope it to be? If it helps, think about how you would compute this. individual computation of this limit, and this is the individual computation of this limit. So this, this is like a, like a small hair to split, but can you always just take two functions, add them together, take the limit of that sum, is that always the same as finding the individual limits and adding them? The answer is yes. Okay, as long as you've got functions, we're good. This is the first law. The second law, which I'm not even going to write on a separate line, is what if you have a difference of two limit, of two functions? We would hope you can compute those limits individually and then just subtract them. And you can. 
in terms of like uh, you know words that you've seen before or used before, this is kind of like distribution of limits over sums and differences is okay. Right, the distributive property. You multiply something by a sum or a difference, and so you can just distribute that through, right? That's what this looks like. The limit applies to F to give you L. The limit applies to G to give you M. Clear? That's okay. So this is one and two combined together for me both. Three. What if you take your original function and you multiply it by something? You think about this in terms of what that does to the function. It scales it, either stretches it vertically or it compresses it vertically. This says distribution of limits over sums and differences is okay. If anyone ever asks you like what the name of this law is, please, or the exact definition, please don't say that. This is like the intuition. Okay. <laughs> it's not like, okay, I'll stop. Just give me the idea here. Oh yeah, this one. If you scale a function up or you scale a function down by vertically shrinking it or stretching it. What effect does that have on the original limit? Do you think it has the same effect? Like you could just take the previous limit and stretch it up? That's the intuition here. You think you could just take your old limit and scale it by that same number? That would be really nice. This would mean that limits preserve vertical stretching and compressing. Okay. It turns out that that's true. Okay? So this third law, something that always happens, is that you can essentially factor or factoring out constants from limits is okay. Let's see, something that we just did. We just did this one, right? The limit of sine of x over x as x goes to 0. This one was, we just did it, 1, right? That was on the board, one of the things we filled out before on the Google Sheet. So this is my function. What if I took this function and multiplied it by like seven? Now I've got seven times that. This law says immediately I can take seven times this limit. I factored out the constant. So this limit is seven times that limit, which is seven times one, which is seven. Factoring that constants from limits is okay. You can actually say a lot more about this law. Um, it doesn't have to be a constant. I don't think you need to know this. Um, so any factor which does not involve x, so the thing that we're using, the thing that we're approaching. C can be anything, actually. If it doesn't involve x, it can be factored out. So for example, I could I could write some crazy function that doesn't use this variable. 
y squared over natural log of y minus 10. There's no x in there. If there's no relationship between y and x, and I'm taking the limit as x goes to a of this, well then I can just write this as this function of y times the limit as x goes to a of our original function. That's totally fine. It can be a constant, it can be a function of other variables that don't depend on the one we're looking at. But, uh, sort, of, sort of a fact right there. It goes beyond just the constant law. Next one. Let's see, we've added functions together, we've subtracted functions from one another, we've multiplied functions by numbers, what are we missing? Huh? What are other operations we can do with functions? Division. Okay, that's, that's law 5, which is okay. Let's skip to that one. What if we take a function divided by another function? Okay, take the limit of their quotient. Well, the result is actually this, which is astonishing. It's the quotient of their limits. Under one assumption. What's that assumption? What's not zero? This limit cannot be zero. That happens for some. For out. Pick last. Okay. This is that's I think astonishing. So the previous one, division by functions was good. What do we miss? Inverse to division is multiplication. What if we take the product of two functions? Well, same thing happens. We take half of x times g of x, <clears throat> and that's going to equal the product of their limits. are essentially our algebra tools now for working with limits. Okay. When we learned how to like factor polynomials, that was one of the tools, an algebraic tool we used to solve for zeros. Okay. Now we're learning sort of the tools for rewriting limits and working with limits that we know exist. All of this is predicated on one thing though. These two limits exist. Okay, so in practice, usually what is done before any of these rules are applied is usually the functions are identified and you verify the individual limits exist. That comes first and foremost. Because if you try to, you know, come up with these sorts of, if you try to apply these sorts of rules, uh, you can get really wonky things if one of these limits or both of these limits don't exist. Okay, and if you just do a bulk, if you do a whole bunch of work to only find it doesn't exist, you're going to kick yourself for not checking this first. Okay, you might also come up with wrong answers, assuming they exist and using these things. This limit might not be the actual object you're looking for. So let's look at a few examples of usage then. Here's going to be a graph, and 
here is a function g sort of decreases down until it reaches this minimum point of negative 2, then it pops up, it's discontinuous, it breaks to negative 1, and then increases along the way. Do I need to, yes, this cross is exactly up 2. Here's the function f. f is strange. At negative 2, f sort of comes up like this. has what we call a cusp, it comes to like a, a point like this, but right at the point, it's actually not defined there. It pops up here, we'll say to evaluate 1, 2, this is at a height of 1, and then it comes down, goes up like this, you know, 1 it's exactly at 2. Right there, and then it just comes down. Okay, so this is our function f in green. So I discussed last time how to find limits of functions from the graphs, and basically it's just looking at the height of the graph uh, as you trace it closer and closer to the x value you're looking for. So the question overall is, what is the limit as x goes to negative 2? of f plus 5 g of x. Sorry that my scale is way off. Negative 1 is like shallow. And positive 1 is like pretty high up there. So in practice, the first thing you check is that both individual limits exist. Can you tell me the function limit of f as x goes to negative 2? What is that? 1, 1. Yeah, so it looks close to 1 if my graph is at all reasonable. So that exists, right? From the left it looks like it's coming there, and from the right it looks like it's coming there, so we're good. The fact that it pops up to 2 is irrelevant. Your table of values would give you these values, these heights, getting closer and closer to this height. Your table of values would not tell you this one. Okay. How about the limit as x goes to negative 2 of g of x? Does it exist? Yeah. Yeah, and what is it? Negative. Negative 1, if my graph is at all to the lead, to be the lead. Yeah. So we trace it here. It looks like it's getting closer to this height of negative 1. We trace it here, it's getting closer to this height of negative 1. So there's the limit. Okay, they both exist. Sweet. We've got a sum of limits. So if we take this one, we can rewrite it as individual limits. can distribute that or factor out, in a sense, that limit. This we can immediately conclude because we found that already. It's 1. The next one, we know this limit exists, so we can factor out this 5. So now we just put what that limit is. 1 plus 5 times negative 1. 1 minus 5 is negative 4. Boom, got it. Okay? We applied rule 1 and then we applied rule not 1. Whatever it was. Okay? So this is just the, sort of the algebra of working with these things. Um,
Okay. Should take you just a split second to work on this one. Split second is over. Just a little bit less than a tish. Okay. What is it? Mm -hmm. Louder. It's not. It's not negative. Oh, it doesn't exist. Uh, that sounds better. Why not? Right here. We've got two values. The right hand limit for G is negative one. The left hand limit for G is negative two. They don't agree. Limit of G is not M. This doesn't exist. That's like, you know, division by does not exist is even worse than division by zero. Okay. All right. We clear on that? Very good. kind of have to estimate this one. My graph's not perfect. I'll accept a, a variety of answers on this next question. Limit of f over g as x goes to 0. I'll accept, again, a variety of answers. It might be easier if you just like give me a fraction instead of like a decimal representation. I'd appreciate that. Do both limits exist? Okay, left hand limit here, right hand, they agree. Left hand, right hand, okay, we're good. Okay, so we rewrite this as the limit of f over the limit of g. We always forget this, so we always rewrite it. So the more you do this, the more you forget to write those things. So it's just a play. Okay, those values are approximately one and negative one and a half, negative one point six. Yeah, these are all good. Two negative two thirds. Okay, one over. I like negative one and a half, so we'll do that, which is negative two thirds. Cool. Yeah, sure. Okay. If this is negative 1.5, which doesn't scale at all like that. So. Good? We good on that? Okay. Okay, good. Just applications of those laws. Okay. Next, we'll look at the pattern. See if you can pick out the pattern. Okay, we're just going to let that happen. Okay, this is just that. Okay. What is the limit? As x goes to a of f of x times f of x. L squared. Very good. Because it's the limit of this times the limit of that. We know the limit of each individually exists because it's one thing, and both of them are L. So the limit of this product is the product of the limits. Okay? We know this limit now, that's L squared. What's this one? Very good, L cubed. This limit is still L. We just determined this one, that's F times F. That's L squared. So this limit of this product is this is the product of this limit and this limit, L cubed. Okay. 
what's the pattern? The limit as x goes to a of f of x raised to the nth power, maybe even over 9,000, would be, assuming L is the limit of the first one, L to the n. Yeah, just. This would be n limits multiplied together. All of them are the limit of f of x. And so that's just the pattern. This is another law. If you have a function that you know the limit of at a specific a, then you can raise that power on the function as well as raising the power on the limit. And it's no different. Take the limit first, raise to the power. Or take the power first and then take the limit. Doesn't matter. So maybe that was too fast. If I take the power of our function and evaluate that first, then take the limit. That's the same as taking the limit first, the original function's limit, and then after that, raising it to that power. They're the same. Okay. It's called the power law. Uh, there's a nice little uh, reciprocal identity here. We're going to suppose that this limit exists still, and we're going to take the square root of our function. And, and we're going to have to assume something here. We're going to have to assume that our function is positive. Okay? So our function has to be either positive or zero close to A. Otherwise, we run into issues with complex numbers. So it's kind of an added assumption here. You can also write this like so. This is the root of our limits. And the assumption here is that the limit of f of x is non-negative. Okay? This is called the root law. And there's a pattern to be followed just like this power law. And the general statement is if you have any root of your function, you can, in a sense, bring the limit into that root. Again, under the stipulation that if n is even, then this is non-negative or this is non-negative. So, close to x equals a. So that means if we get x close to a, the result of the function is at least 0 or positive. We don't care if the function is negative elsewhere. We just care nearby this limit, this limit point. Okay. This is called the root law. Okay. Next one. This is the easiest one of the day. There's one kind of function. Maybe you can intuit. There's one kind of function that's just like the simplest kind of function, and. Uh, it doesn't really change much. Uh, maybe it doesn't even really depend on x. What kind of function is that? A function that doesn't really change much. Doesn't really go up or down much. It just stays the same. We call those constant functions. So if c is just some number. Okay? This might go without saying, but if our function is just a constant, What's its limit? Yeah, it's not constant. You take the left-hand limit. You plug in anything you want. Literally anything. What is your function? That constant. OK, so the left-hand limit is C. You take the right-hand limit. Plug in anything you want to the right. 
The function's still constant over there, so the right hand limit is C, so it's definitely that constant. Okay, so C. is just some real number, okay? So just a constant number. Questions? Yeah. No? Okay. Still none? Okay. Get down to just like this some examples of real functions that you're familiar with and look at some of their limits and see if we can apply some of these rules to get um, to gain some knowledge here. Okay? Um, this is just a line. The line is x. So as x gets close to a, what does x become? As x gets closer and closer to a, what is x? x is a. a. Thank you. Very good. Perfect. Well done. This is really good news for you. Because there's a large class of functions that are built out of this guy. This property says now that the limit of any power of x is just a. Just plug it in. This is the plug it in property. a to the n. <coughs> if I multiply this guy by any constant, the result is c times a to the n. Just plug it in again. Oh boy. This is great. Yes, you can. This is great. Sorry about that. But this is phenomenal because we're going to pair this with the sum of the difference property that we had before. And now what do we know about all polynomial functions? If you have the limit of any polynomial, this is just a polynomial. What can you do to find that limit? The polynomial is a sum of a bunch of these things, or a difference of a bunch of these things. So you would find the limits of all of those things. And for each of those individually, you can just immediately plug this number right in for x. Which means the limit of this polynomial is the same as all of that together. So what can you do for any polynomial? You just plug this number right into there. <coughs> wow, okay, what's the limit of x to the 57 minus x squared plus 1? As x gets closer and closer to the, let's go with 1. It's a polynomial, big power polynomial. <coughs> but no matter what I give you, x going to whatever, because this is a polynomial, you can just plug this straight in. It's 1 to the 57 minus 1 squared plus 1. It's just 1. Check. Yeah, done. Just plug it in. Okay, now there's, there's this big problem now of what other function types can I just plug that number into? Because that was easy, right? So to find the limit, it would be great if I could just plug that thing in. It doesn't always work that way. I drew a graph over here where you, know, you couldn't just plug values in. The function f came up, popped up, and then came back down. If you plugged it in at that value, you would have gotten the wrong solution. So we're going to spend a little bit more time talking next time at the beginning about another type of function you can plug them into. And then we're going to deal with the harder subjects. Okay? Good. Uh, don't forget that homework is due tomorrow night and that there's a quiz Friday on the stuff that the homework was on. Okay? Alright. Have a good day.